Our speaker today is Christy Grimm. Christy is the College Outreach Manager for Food Allergy Research and Education. As part of the FAIR team, Grimm works with, uh, with us to ensure the safety and inclusion of students with food allergies on college campuses. Christy has worked with committees and expert stakeholders to develop FAIR's pilot guidelines for managing food allergies in higher education, which form the basis for the College Food Allergy Program. She is currently working with universities to implement the guidelines and training during a pilot phase of the program. So at this time, I will turn the presentation over to Christy. Thank you, Lynn. Um, so just to get started today, the first thing I'd like to do is give everybody an update on where we're at with the college program um, and where we came from. I know I get a lot of questions about it. Um, so the creation of the college program was really inspired by a host of issues. From a student and a parent perspective, there were a lot of challenges in getting accommodations through dining services, resident services, um, and disability services. And on the other side um, of the coin, many colleges and universities were also feeling frustration, not knowing who students with food allergies were in many cases, and also struggling with some of the risk-taking behaviors and lack of self-advocacy, as well as just a general lack of knowledge of the best ways to accommodate these students. Um, so what we saw as the number of college students with food allergies were continuing to grow, these issues were also continuing to grow, and we wanted to create a program that could really help both sides. Ultimately, parents and students and colleges usually want the same things, which is safe students who are able to fully participate. So the goal of the college program is really to help make that happen. Um, to begin with, we had submitted a grant, which was approved by a private family foundation to fully support the program for three years. Um, and the main program components are outlined here. So we created comprehensive guidelines, which really were aimed at helping colleges with identifying their students with food allergies, finding best practices for communicating with them, um, and setting up accommodations and training um, in dining services as well as what proper emergency response would be. Um, the piece of that there, dining services training, the way that we work to do that through this college program is contracting with a company called Menu Trinfo that has allergy training specifically designed for colleges and universities. So we've actually through this program offered that to close to 100 colleges now um, and the pilot schools are all taking part in that as well. We also wanted to develop some parent and student educational materials that really provide a starting point as you're looking at college and what questions you need to be asking, who the departments are that you should be talking to on campuses, um, and resident advisor training. So students interact with resident advisors perhaps more than any other university staff, and oftentimes they're more comfortable going to them with issues. So we wanted to make sure RAs knew about the seriousness of food allergies, recognizing and responding to anaphylaxis, um, as well as some of the issues that they can help students with, like encouraging self-advocacy and mitigating risk-taking. Um, and then the final piece is looking at how we can help students through student social groups. Um, so those groups are able to provide mentorship for incoming students um, and also working together to advocate for themselves on and off campus. Um, so to start the college program, we started with a research phase, and the first bit of that was a college summit in January of 2014. We brought together 30 colleges with dining services to talk about some of the challenges that dining services were facing, as well as best practices that were working well. Um, we had a second one in April of 2014. We again had over 30 colleges there, um, but this, this summit represented a little bit broader of an audience. So we had disability services, resident life and housing services, health services and dining services all represented, um, as well as a group of parents and students. Following those summits, we formed three committees that really helped advise and review the guidelines and parent and student materials. Um, so we had an access services guidance committee, which was composed of disability services, resident life, health services, as well as the liaison from the Department of Education. We had a dining services committee that was mostly chefs, registered dietitians, and different managers in dining services, and then a parent and student committee. Based on that, we created these. These are the two main materials that you can download from our website right now. Um, so the FAIR pilot guidelines for managing food allergies in higher education. Those are aimed at colleges, and it provides overview and tips for managing food allergies on campus, um, and everything from a section for disability services to dining services. 
Um, and then the other piece are educational brochures for prospective college students and current college students. And they kind of outline some of what we're going to go over in this webinar today. They're talking about the different departments on campus and things that you can think about when you're meeting with them. Um, so right now, we just recently launched the pilot stage a little over a month ago. We selected 12 pilot schools that we're going to work very closely with to implement and test those guidelines. We selected them for a variety of reasons. We were looking to have a wide representation of the types of universities. Um, so we have some large, medium, and small schools. We have public and private. We have contract managed dining services versus self-operating. Um, if you haven't been on a lot of college campuses yet, one thing that you'll learn as you do is that dining services can either be managed by the college or they oftentimes have contracts with big companies that run their dining services. Um, and we also wanted to have a representation from schools that were just starting with their food allergy programs all the way up through schools that have already well-established programs and are just looking for ways to improve. So over the course of this year, we're going to work with them. We're going to provide them some free training and resources. And at the end of this year, we're going to look at ways that we need to improve our program um, and how we can more broadly roll it out across the country. So these are the 12 pilot schools. Um, which are also up on our website. You can see them. Um, University of Southern California, University of Arizona, Texas A&M, University of Northern Colorado, University of Chicago, Valparaiso University, University of Michigan, Wesleyan University, College of the Holy Cross, King's College, George Mason University, and North Carolina State. At the end of this po uh, pilot program, what we're really hoping to do in 2016 is roll out a database where colleges will be able to go up and sign up and say exactly what they have implemented on their campus so that parents and students are able to log in and see that and be able to judge a little bit just from the starting point where these colleges are at. Um, so getting into what you guys really want to know is you're starting this process if you're in high school or you're a parent of a high school student or maybe you've just started college, um, what do you need to do? What do you need to know about the process of going to college with food allergies? First off, right off the bat, um, especially if you're still in high school, start preparing now. Don't wait until you're on a college campus to get ready to self-advocate. College representatives want to hear directly from their students. And so they'll talk to parents, especially early on in the process, but they really want their students to come and seek them out and tell them about their needs. Um, so if you can, start preparing now, whether you're a student or if you're a parent, start preparing your student now. Um, when you go out to eat, explain your food allergies yourself. Let your, your child explain their food allergies themselves. Involve them in discussions with their school about accommodations. This is especially important when you're talking to the schools directly. Don't try not to have a conversation with disability services without the student there. Try to involve them so they know exactly what's going on. Um, help them get comfortable explaining their food allergies to those who need to know. So that could be friends or teachers. Um, help them plan options for how to remain socially included. So if your friends are all going out to a restaurant that's not safe, how are you going to handle that, having those plans ahead of time? Um, and just start reading labels and learning how to prepare food, especially if you intend to cook at all while you're on, in, excuse me, on college campus. The earlier you start with these processes, the better equipped you're going to be when you arrive on campus. Um, so the different departments that you're going to encounter or might encounter when you go to college. Um, disability services, which is also sometimes called access services, housing services, resident life, dining services, and health services. Um, so the roles that these departments will play, disability services is usually going to help you set up accommodations if you need them in academic, in academics and housing, um, and sometimes in dining services as well. Housing services is usually the department that handles room assignments. So if you're going for requests like a single room or you want to be matched with someone else with a food allergy, housing services will often be the department that handles that. Resident life is usually the department that handles programming in the dorms, so dorm parties or floor events, as well as training for resident life staff like resident advisors. Um, and on some campuses, these are one department. Some campuses, they're different. And then the role of dining services, obviously, is to provide food to the students living on campus and just eating there, if, even if they don't live on campus. Um, when you're talking to disability services, 
this is a key, kind of key piece of information, especially if they don't already know how food allergies fall under ADA. The Leslie University lawsuit has some really good language that I would encourage you to go online and read. It's all online on the Department of Justice's website. Um, so right here, they're from their Q&A about Leslie University, a disability as defined by ADA is a mental or physical impairment that substantially limits a major life activity, such as eating. Major life activities also include major bodily functions, such as the functions of the gastrointestinal system. Some individuals with food allergies have a disability as defined by ADA, particularly those with more significant or severe responses to certain foods. This would include individuals with celiac disease and others who have autoimmune responses to certain foods, the symptoms of which may include difficulty swallowing or breathing, asthma, or anaphylactic shock. So most people with a very severe food allergy are going to be covered under ADA. Um, so once you've selected a school, that's actually the place that we recommend you start, is by meeting with disability services first. Um, their role, again, is going to be ha helping you set up documentation. They're going to be the ones who are going to be able to tell you exactly what documentation you need to provide based on the accommodations you're requesting. And they can help you set up accommodation in housing, academics, or dining. Um, even if the only accommodation you want is something with a meal plan, I still recommend starting with, house or with disability services. Um, and one of the big things that you should think about when you're doing that is the academic accommodation piece. So if you have a reaction and you're unable to attend class, having that plan in place with disability services ahead of time so that you're not sick and having to deal with emailing your professors is always a good idea. Um, however, one thing to keep in mind is that the role of disability services may vary from school to school. On some campuses, they're really only involved in academic accommodations. On some, they'll get involved with housing and dining. On some, they'll just do housing and academics. Um, so that role can vary widely, and you might have to meet with different people to get what you need. Um, what are you hoping to hear from disability services when you meet with them? You want them to understand ADA as it relates to food allergies. You want them to be willing to work with you to find solutions. You want them to be willing and able to coordinate accommodations with other departments. But you also need to keep in mind that this may be a new topic for many disability services offices. Until the Leslie University lawsuit in 2012, many of them didn't view food allergies as a disability at all. Um, so even if they are involved, it may be new, and they may not be involved at all yet. Um, you may need to do some education about food allergies and what your needs are. Um, and some of these accommodations may be handled by different departments on campus. So some of the housing accommodations may be handled directly through housing services rather than through disability services. Same thing with the dining accommodations. Um, some questions that you can think about when you're meeting with disability services. The, uh, what documentation do you need to provide to establish your food allergy as a disability with them? Um, what is the process for requesting accommodations? What paperwork do you need to fill out to get that done? What academic accommodations can be made if your son or daughter has a reaction and is, is unable to attend classes for a time? What accommodations do you need from dining and do they have the processes and tools in place to offer them? Um, and what accommodations do you need from housing and do they have the resources to offer them? So for housing services accommodations, some of the common requests that I see from parents and students are for things like a single room or a room with access to a kitchen um, or being paired with a roommate with a food allergy. So when you're thinking about whether the school can make these accommodations, some of these are going to be limited by what resources the school has available. For example, if the campus does not have any housing that has kitchens in it, they wouldn't be able to do that accommodation necessarily. Um, so when you're thinking about what accommodations you really need, you want to be you want to have those in mind and then also make sure that the school is actually able to provide it for you. You want to weigh the pros and cons of various options. Um, a lot of people jump right to getting a single room and that may be the best solution for you um, because it can provide that allergen free space. But on the other hand, it can be socially isolating for students um, and the student may be alone in their room in the event of a reaction. Being paired with a roommate with a food allergy can be really great because the roommate might be a little bit more understanding and respectful about bringing allergens into the room, but the roommates could be otherwise incompatible. You know, if you're a morning person and your roommate with a food allergy is a night owl, that can cause some conflict, um, or if you're neat and they're messy. And then the access to a full kitchen, obviously it's great for some students to be able to prepare their own food, but on the other hand, it requires a lot of time and you're just starting college, and so that may not necessarily be the best solution for you. 
um, you just want to think about very carefully what really is the best solution for you. All right. Okay, um, so when you're meeting with housing services and resident life, another thing you really want to ask about is the emergency procedures for the dorm. So RAs are RAs trained to recognize anaphylaxis. Where will the emergency responders come from and will they have epinephrine on them? How long does it take them to get to the dorm? Um, at most colleges and universities, just so you guys know right off the bat, resident advisors will not be allowed to administer epinephrine. On some campuses, there are emergency responders that are located right on campuses that will respond to an emergency, and sometimes they have stock epinephrine. On other campuses, that's not the case. It might be the city EMTs or the fire department that's responding. So you want to know those, those ahead of time so that you can plan accordingly. Um, another question for them is, how can your student get safe food during special events? So dorm parties and floor events are very, very common, and they often involve food. And so if you want to be able to be included in those talking to resident life ahead of time about exactly what your options are for getting safe food is a good idea. Um, dining services, if you are planning to eat on campus or participate in food prepared by them at all, will play a critical role in keeping you safe. It's important to set up a meeting with them. So even if you meet with disability services and they set up some sort of meal plan accommodation for you, you still want to get that face-to-face -face with dining services because on a day-in, day-out basis, they're going to be the ones preparing your food. This is usually going to be a registered dietitian, a chef, or a manager who will handle these. Um, so you'll want to meet with them, talk to them about your needs and what exactly it is they can do for you. And you should also ask if you can take a tour of dining services during normal service hours so you can really get a feel for how they handle food pro the food process. Some questions to think about when you're meeting with dining services. How do you accommodate students with food allergies? Um, and we'll go over a little bit more about some of the common ways that schools are doing that on the next slide. How can students access allergen information for the menus? Um, some schools list them online, some schools list them in the dining hall, sometimes they're available upon request. Um, so how do they do that for you? Who is the designated person in the dining hall students can go to with food allergy questions? Um, and is there a designated person? Has the dining staff been trained to recognize anaphylaxis and what are the emergency procedures in the dining facilities? And so similar to what we talked about with, with housing and resident life, on most campuses, dining services staff are not going to be allowed to administer epinephrine and they're not going to have stock epinephrine. Um, there are actually only four states currently that have laws that would allow a university to have stock epinephrine on hand. Um, those are Oregon, Florida, New Jersey, and Indiana. Um, so outside of that, you're not going to encounter a school that keeps stock epinephrine in the dining halls at all. Um, and it's unlikely that you'll encounter a school that would allow their staff to administer. Um, and then the last question here, has the dining staff undergone any food allergy training and are there ongoing training reminders? Um, so you really want to make sure that the people who are preparing your food actually understand cross-contact um, and the dangers and um, know how to prepare your safe food. So some of the common dining services solutions are listed up here. Um, one of those is pre-ordered meals, and that's usually a situation where you would text or email your order ahead of time, and they would prepare it for you and have you waiting at the time that you said you would be in the dining hall. Um, obviously, a pro of this, you can have a variety of options because you can text an order. The food is ready when you arrive, so it's easy. Um, a con is that you have to plan ahead. And so, you know, you, if you're a student, you know yourself. If you're a parent, you know your student. So when you're thinking about whether this will work for you, you've got to really think about whether you're actually going to take the time to do this on a daily basis. Another common option is allergy-friendly hot stations, and those are usually going to be stations that are top free of most of the top eight or all of the top eight allergens, as well as gluten. Um, so it's quick. You don't have to plan ahead of time. It's a great option for students who just want to run in and grab something and not have to think about it. But it's the con of that is you're going to have to give up perhaps more than your actual allergen. If you are just allergic to milk, you might have to give up seven other allergens. Um, and also, if you have an allergy outside of the top eight, this is obviously not going to be a solution that works really well for you. Um, another solution, short order stations. That would be where you go up and you place an order and they make it for you there. 
So again, this gives you more options and a little bit more variety, and it doesn't require you to plan ahead, but it can take more time. So if, uh, if you're someone who likes to go into the dining hall with your friends, you know, by the time they're sitting down, they could be halfway through your meal before you have your, your meal, and that could be potentially a little bit isolating for you. Um, and then this fourth solution, an allergy-friendly or gluten-free pantry, is getting pretty common on campuses. And this is just a separate area where they stock certain items. Um, so it's always available, which is nice. It's usually done in combination with some of the other options because it doesn't always have a lot of hot options in there. Um, but obviously, there are going to be a little bit fewer options as well. Um, so self-serve dining areas. As you tour campuses, you'll notice that a lot of colleges, most of the dining services is going to be self-service areas um, where students go up and they grab their own food and it's very buffet style. So what I found is that even though a lot of colleges are offering a lot of other options, you can order your own meals prepared specially and back, a lot of students still go up to those self-serve areas. Um, and I just want to caution everybody about those because while the colleges and universities can work to lower risk, they can focus on a smart layout and try to be as um, diligent as possible at keeping the area clean. Uh, you can't prevent 100% against cross-contact on those areas. All it takes is one student to come up and touch the serving utensil to their plate that has an allergen on it and then that item might, may no longer be safe. Um, so I do encourage students to take advantage of some of those other options that their schools offer them rather than just going up and eating off of those self-serve areas. Um, health services. So the role of health services, perhaps more than any other department on campus, really varies widely from school to school. Um, so it's important on each campus that you're visiting or considering, you would really have to talk to them and find out exactly what it is that they can offer. So on some campuses, they can provide a lot of medical care. On some campuses, they have a pharmacy where you can get epinephrine refills if you need them. They might offer nutritional campus or nutritional counseling. Sometimes they have dietitians on staff who will meet with you and really help you plan for healthy eating with your food allergies. Um, they might offer mental health counseling, which can really come into play if you do have a reaction and you're experiencing some anxiety or stress about it, having a counselor to go talk to. Um, and so depending on what they offer, you may need to seek health care off of campus or you may not, um, but find out what they offer. And if they aren't a viable option for you for ongoing health care, if you can't get prescription refills there, just plan out where you're going to get them. Is there a pharmacy or a doctor's office near campus where you can go instead? Um, so we talked about this a little bit already, but just something to be aware of. On most campuses, university staff will not have access to SOC epinephrine and will not be allowed to administer a student's epinephrine auto-injector. Um, so before you get to campus, you really want to know, again, who the campus emergency responders are. Is it someone on campus locally? Do they have a campus-based EMT service? Is it the local fire department, local EMTs? How long does it take them to get to campus, and how long does it take for them to find something on campus? So if it's a city one, one of the issues potentially could be that if you're in the dorm room and you have a reaction, they may not be able to find you very quickly. So you just want to talk those issues through and know ahead of time. Um, and then do those responders carry epinephrine? So whoever it is, if it's a fire department or local EMTs or a local campus group, are they carrying epinephrine with them? And a big piece that often gets kind of overlooked in this whole process as you're working to set up all these accommodations is the issue of student responsibilities and what those are. Um, so we're just going to go through some of the big ones. Uh, and keeping in mind that every school is going to have their own potential list that they might want you to follow through, depending on what solutions they have in dining services, they might have unique things that they expect you to do. So you'll want to always talk to the school about what those are ahead of time as well. Um, but number one, always carry your epinephrine with you. Any other medications that you might need, you, it's a good idea to carry them with you. Um, you want to disclose your food allergies to your school before you arrive on campus. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to disclose them before you're accepted to the school, um, but before you start school, you should disclose it to them so that you can set things up ahead of time. You want to keep an open line of communications with those involved in your food allergy accommodations, but especially dining services, um, disability services, if they're involved at all, and housing services. If there is a problem, you should be reporting it immediately. If you have a reaction in, dining, in the dining hall, seek medical care. But as soon as you are, you're safe and you're okay, 
you want to make sure you're telling dining services so they know. And something I hear from a lot of colleges and universities um, is that they, they have never had a student in their dining halls have a reaction from any of their food. And I think that that's indicative of the fact that students are probably having reactions and not sharing that information. And if a school doesn't know that you've had a reaction, they're not going to address it. Um, so you want to make sure you're telling them right away. Uh, you want to be your own best self-advocate. No one can advocate for you like you can advocate for yourself. So tell others what you need. Let dining services know what you need. Tell them what's working, what's not working. Take the time to explain your food allergies to those who need to know. If you're eating out off of campus, tell your server. Don't be afraid to ask questions about what's in your food. You want to avoid unnecessary risk. So again, never eat food you're unsure of. Um, whether that's something on the self-serve line that you're not quite sure about or it looks like it might have come into contact with something else, um, just ask questions. Ask for something from back instead of eating off of that self-serve line. You want to plan ahead for social events where food will be served, whether that's a dorm party, if you're going to a party at someone's house, um, if you're going to a catered event, just plan ahead for how you're going to get food. Keep in mind that alcohol may contain undisclosed allergens. So some of you, if you're just starting this process, you're probably not 21 yet. But as you reach that age in college, think about the fact that they're not all, alcohol is often not reg regulated um, to contain ingredient lists. And so it could contain something that you would be allergic to. Um, and then also, of course, alcohol can lead to other risk-taking behavior. So you want to be extremely cautious about it. And finally, if you experience a reaction, tell someone. Don't go off on your own. Don't go to the bathroom. Don't go back to your dorm to administer epinephrine by yourself. Let someone know. Administer epinephrine right away if you need to. All right. Um, how can you get involved? So if you are a high school junior or senior or you're a current college student, you can join the FAIR College Food Allergy Support Group on Facebook. It is a fairly new group. Um, and so. It's, it's small right now, but it's a great group of students. You can get in there if you have questions and you want to talk to other students about what their experiences have been. It's a great place to connect. Um, when you get to college, consider joining a student group if there is one on campus. If there's not one, consider creating one. Student groups, like we talked about before, can be an important source of support. And also, you know, if you really want to see change on a campus, a group of students working together can accomplish great things. Um, and you can encourage your school to use the FAIR College Guidelines for Managing Food Allergies in Higher Education, which they can download for free on the website, even if it's just looking through them and seeing areas that maybe they hadn't thought about or haven't addressed in their own programs before. Um, and if you guys want, I didn't put this email address on the slide, but for additional questions, we do have an email set up. Um, it is collegeprogram at foodallergy.org. So feel free to shoot questions or feedback or information, um, you know, share experiences about your time in college or your process looking at colleges. We're always happy to hear from you. Okay. Thank you so much, Christy, for a very thorough presentation today. Um, if you wouldn't. Okay. So before we get into the uh, question and answer portion of today's presentation, um, I would like to just remind everybody that our monthly webinar series is only one component of FAIR's educational programming, and our annual signature live educational event, the National Food Allergy Conference, will be taking place next month on May 16th. Uh, to 17th in Long Beach, California. Attendees can expect an outstanding lineup of speakers and presentations, and the conference has secured a wide range of expert-led sessions to help people live well with food allergies at every stage of the journey. So those who register for the conference this week also will save $50 on their registration fee, and you can learn a little bit more about this year's program at foodallergy.org forward slash conference. I've also included a link in our chat window. I have also included the email address in our chat window um, that Christy has just given for any questions pertinent to the college program, which is, again, collegeprogram at foodallergy.org. So thank you to everyone who has submitted questions in advance of today's webinar and during today's webinar. So we are going to try to get to as many questions as possible with our remaining time today. Um, some of the questions, again, if they are sort of personal and individual type cases, um, we encourage you to email us at collegeprogramsfoodallergy.org and we'll try to answer questions that appeal to the general audience today. Um, so one question that came up was related to um, some of the specific needs of student athletes. 
who may have to travel to games sometimes overnight and they may have a difficult time getting safe food. So do you have any recommendations for student athletes in their on-campus experience? <laughs> yeah, that can be a challenging situation. I actually do periodically get calls from universities and students about that exact issue. And so a lot of times what I recommend is working with the coaching staff. Um, if they're eating out when they're on the road, a lot of coaching staff will be very supportive of that and really try to pick restaurants that will work well for you. You can plan those meals out ahead of time instead of having to grab something on the fly when you're on the road. Um, another thing is that a lot of times coaching staff will be able to connect you with dietitians that can really give you that nutritional counseling. Um, if your health services or your dining services doesn't have it, sometimes teams will have it. Anyway, so I would encourage you to seek, seek that out as well. Great. And um, just as a little PSA for um, those of you who are asking, a reminder that the slides, um, in addition to the webinar being recorded and posted on the website in about a week, um, the slides will also be posted online in PDF format. So um, I know a lot of people have wanted to save the slides, and I'm trying to respond to those questions individually, but just so that you know, they will be available on Sarah's website in our webinar section. Um, one question that came in is related to housing accommodations, and um, the college that they're considering uh, states that the freshmen must live, that freshmen must live on campus, and they would like to ask for an option to commute outside of the 10 mile range, um, and they would like to sort of request that accommodation. Is this something that they would go to disability services for, or is this a more appropriate question for housing, or is it a little bit of both? Um, it could be both. It really depends on the campus. I would start with disability services because that is something that would fall under an ADA accommodation. And, and so disability services, if they, if they handle housing accommodations, would be the one who would field that request. If it's a campus where disability services really only works on academic accommodations, then housing services would likely be the group that would be handling that. Um, so start with disability services, and if they tell you they don't, they don't deal with housing issues, then I would go from there to housing services. Great, thank you. Um, one of the questions that has come up is sort of um, more of a probably a general advocacy type question, but um, some people have been asking for a little bit more insight as to why university staff are not allowed to administer epinephrine and um, actions that they might be able to take for mobilizing change. <laughs> <laughs> so that is a good question, and I will say that the four states that have laws allowing um, higher education institutions to stock epinephrine, they also provide legal protections and liability protection for, for university staff. And those are fairly recent. Um, so just like in the K through 12 environment where it kind of trickled from state to state, I think that it's likely that that's going to happen with colleges and universities as well. There is a lot of pending legislation across the country that would allow um, colleges and universities or really any entity, so restaurants and, and you know, water parks and things like that to stock epinephrine. So that change is, is probably coming. Um, so that's hope for the future. Um, but as far as why schools outside of those four states typically don't do it, a lot of times it's just a liability thing. Um, and then without the ability to legally get stock epinephrine, um, there, you know, and those laws that sort of build in those protections, schools just aren't aren't willing or able to go down those roads. Um, so the four states again that have that legislation currently in it's Florida and Oregon, and those states have entity laws. So again, any restaurant or water park or camp or anybody would be able to get stock up and effort, and those laws also build in those protections um, for staff that would administer it. And then New Jersey and Indiana have higher education specific legislation that would allow universities to stock epinephrine and administer them. Great, thank you, Christy. And as a sort of follow up to that question is for um, students that may be attending a school that is not in one of these states, what are some recommendations in terms of how the student can best communicate for if they need help administering epinephrine? Um, so that can be a little bit of a challenge, and I would actually talk directly to the school about what they would recommend. Um, and, you know, you can always have those conversations with staff, too. So when you're meeting with dining services, you can ask them, you know, what happens if I have a reaction and I can't administer my epinephrine? What's the process for that? And really just engage them in those conversations. You can have the same conversation with resident life. Um, I just, you know, be prepared for the fact that 
the university is probably going to tell them that they're not allowed to do that. Um, but I think it's always helpful to have those open conversations with them and let them know that that could be a need you would have. Okay. Um, one of the questions that came up is uh, sort of related to dining services and had sort of asked for some insights on addressing schools that may not have a dining hall per se, but they have sort of like a food court type setup. Um, do you have any insights on that? Um, so that actually is, is, I think, more unusual. Most schools have at least some sort of residential dining, but we are working with one school that, that only does that food court style. Um, and so a lot of times they'll do the same kinds of accommodations as other schools. You just have to meet with them ahead of time. So it could be something where, you know, you're able to, to send an order and they'll have something prepared and they'll have it ready at one of those locations. Those schools often lend themselves to more of that kind of short order situation where you walk up and you tell someone you have an allergy and then maybe a manager comes and prepares you something separately and back. Um, so when you're looking at whether that will work for you, you just really want to have those conversations with them about what exactly they can do to prepare you food and whether you feel comfortable with that solution. Okay. Um, another question that sort of came through is related to the the timing of uh, figuring out allergy information um, during the college application process. So is that something that students should sort of start figuring out and have completely figured out before they complete the college application process or can some of that be worked out after the student is accepted? Um, so I, this is actually something, there are people on both sides of this who have very strong opinions. So a lot of people think you should absolutely before you apply to a school, you should talk to them and find out everything that they do for food allergies. And then other people who don't want to do that because they're afraid of being discriminated against because of the food allergies. Um, and I think both sides have some valid concerns. Um, so I don't really make a recommendation on that one way or the other. I think you really have to do what you're comfortable with. But what I would say is um, once you're accepted, for sure you should start having those conversations if you don't do it before that point. And well before you actually arrive on campus to start classes, you should make sure that you've had all of those discussions. You've met with various departments and you know exactly what your plan is for how you're going to eat, where you're going to live, where you're going to get your epinephrine refills, what the emergency response is, so that you're not figuring that out when you arrive on campus and move in. Great. Um, one question had come in about which particular school we're working with that has the food court setting. <laughs> uh, so University of Arizona does not have any residential dining. So they have all, you know, locations that have their own sort of kitchen set up. Okay. Um, so there are a few questions that have kind of come through about um, having a 504 plan in sort of the um, through 12 setting and translating that over to college and so any general recommendations as far as um, how that process works and if somebody has an existing 504 plan you recommend they have a 504 plan before heading into college and and so on so I, I hate I hate to tell you this but you probably will have to start the process over again when you get to college um, colleges and universities at least public ones or ones that receive public funding they are regulated by Section 504, but they operate very differently than the K through 12 environment. So usually you can't just transfer your 504 plan from high school into college. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't provide that to them as a starting point if they want to see, you know, well, what has worked in the past for you. But the setup is going to be so different on most campuses that a lot of the stuff that you did in K through 12 isn't necessarily going to translate really well into the college setting. But just go in there with your documentation. You can take that 504 plan in there and really just talk with them. It should be a process where you work with them to find solutions that will work on your specific campus. Great. Um, now, for colleges that are involved or interested in creating or already have in place some good food allergy management policies and um, perhaps are not part of the FAIR pilot program, um, how are how are we working with those schools? Um, so we are, you know, I'm always available for questions. And so, you know, any school that wants to reach out and ask questions or run things by, by us, they are welcome to do that um, with that same college program at foodallergy.org email address. Um, that's one way. I get calls from people who, are, who want things. We also have a Google group that was created as sort of a way that they could connect with each other to share information. 
students. And I found as I've worked with different colleges and universities that one of the more useful things they can do is talk to someone at a different university who's experiencing the exact same issues and say, you know, this isn't working on our campus, what are you doing? Um, so we created that. It's, there's a link to it on our website on the college program page that university staff can, can go ahead and join and, and connect with other schools. Okay. A few questions have come in um, that are dealing with sort of struggling with how to uh, go through the accommodation process and uh, have some good recommendations for uh, students that are going to be incoming and have multiple uh, food allergies. And so um, can you provide a little bit of insight in terms of some best practices or, you know, good recommendations for individuals going into the college environment that have multiple severe food allergies? Um, so I think with that, the question becomes whether you are going to be able to eat on campus and whether the dining services will be able to accommodate you or not, because I think the accommodations you'll need will be very different depending on, on whether dining services can feed you or not. And so the more food allergies you have, um, especially if multiple of them are very severe, the less or the more likely it is that dining services would let you out of a meal plan. Um, I get a lot of requests about that, whether you can whether the school will let you out of a meal plan that's otherwise required. And the more allergies you have, the more likely it is that they will. Um, they're also often willing to work with you to prepare separate meals to try and keep you safe. So I think you just really want to know what exactly it is that you want from the school and go and prepare to ask for that. And because if you're looking to prepare your own meals and not eat in the, eat in the dining halls, you might need some accommodations in housing um, with access to a kitchen, or you might need an accommodation to allow you to live off campus in an apartment that you've access to the kitchen. Um, but really as a starting point, you need to figure out exactly what it is you want so that you can work with them to accomplish it. Great. And pouring over to uh, College Dining Services, we actually received a question from somebody who works for College Dining Services. And um, they had noted that one of their biggest challenges is reaching the students with food allergies and uh, helping, them, helping them feel comfortable and being able to review options and come up with a plan to meet their needs. So what is the best way for schools to be proactive in reaching the students and making them and helping them to feel comfortable so that they can speak with um, the proper parties and ask for help? So I think this is always a big challenge for, challenge for schools, is how do you reach this audience? Um, and I think there are a lot of ways. You want to make sure that it's up on your website, if you can get some cross-promotion up on other areas of the website. So, you know, on your university's homepage, if people search for food allergies or celiac disease, um, or gluten or peanuts or whatever it is, what do they get? And if they're not getting any result that tells them where to go, it's going to be harder for them to find you in the first place. Another thing is working on getting signage or information up in your dining hall. That's where the students are going to be on a daily basis. And so even a sign that just says, you know, got food allergies, let us know, or talk to this person, or a sign with, you know, the registered dietitian's information, um, cards coming in. So things that was, they're seeing it all the time, and they might, a lot of them might ignore it, but you're putting that information out there so that they're able to easily access it. And one of the, uh, one of the other things that I think we touched on in the presentation, um, but from another dining service staff, is that the, it really is uh, a, a responsibility of the students as they kind of, in their world expands and they enter the college environment to make sure that they're taking the lead in communicating um, so that, you know, they can, make sure that the dining service staff is educated. Is yes. that accurate? Absolutely, yes. Um, and, you know, I encourage you as, as staff at a university to really communicate those responsibilities to your students as well. So whatever it is you expect them to do, let them know. Um, and, you know, we talked about some general ones, but if you guys have unique ones, I would make sure those are communicated. Okay. Um, and I know that the, 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 the concern about, um, you know, college limitations in terms of being able for some, for many staff members to, to administer epinephrine is, um, is pressing on some, some people. And I would say that uh, the best way to sort of enact change and encourage other states to sort of expand their, their laws in terms of epinephrine administration um, is certainly connect with with our advocacy team. Um, if you go to foodallergyadvocacy.org, that is a great way to get involved with our Fair Advocates Network and sort of um, mobilize for change um, in that. Because the question does kind of keep coming up as far as 
how how a change can be enacted in this line. Yeah, um, and you know, you can also always feel free to reach out to your, your local representative and let them know that this is an issue that's important to you and you would like to see them pass. Um, there is pending legislation in quite a few states, like I said, so, you know, putting the pressure on them to let them know that this is an important issue. What are some recommendations for um, working with a school who perhaps may claim to have a good food allergy program and labeling practices, um, but there, there have been instances that where things may be mislabeled and in, in practice they see that perhaps the policies that are in place are not as um, thorough in, in protecting students as they may be. Um, so I think that this is really where those conversations become very important uh, because a school can say that they're doing a hundred different things and, and maybe they are, but that's why you want to take that tour of dining services and why you want to ask questions. And when you're looking at a school, don't be afraid to walk up to one of those stations where you can order food and actually ask the person there, hey, I have a food allergy um, or, you know, I have a milk allergy or I have a weed allergy or egg or whatever it is. Walk up and tell them that and ask them what you can have and see what they do. Um, and if they're not, they're not doing something that would keep you safe, that's something you want to bring to the attention of the manager or the registered dietitian or the um, dining services director to let them know that that's your experience. Um, because, you know, they really do usually, university staff, they want to keep you safe. They want to help you. Um, and you just have to be really comfortable telling them when things are not going well or if you see areas of concern, pointing them out so they can see exactly exactly what's happening. Okay. I think, um, I think you've covered pretty much all of the questions that have, uh, have come in through sort of uh, general practice. And if there are, again, if there are individual questions that are sort of case by case um, and you need a little bit of help kind of navigating things one on one, um, send us an email at collegeprogram at foodallergy.org for any follow-up questions, and we are more than happy to, to help um, in any way that we can in, in terms of navigating that experience. So um, I'd like to 